horrible things for them. My name in, in German, in German is very difficult to pronounce. So I have a Moknai. Moknai. So what's the translation? Forse può chiudere. Si può chiudere, sì. Chiudo qui. Sì. Ok, um, professor Arif uh, Ahmed is teaching philosophy at the University of Cambridge, at the Department of Philosophy of Cambridge, and he, he, he has published the book on uh, Sol Kripke, on contemporary philosophy, and his interests uh, have a wide range from contemporary philosophy, metaphysics, and uh, theory of decisions. He has been here for uh, three weeks till now, uh, teaching regularly on uh, <clears throat> logic and uh, theory of decisions. And uh, uh, he's also well known for having, uh, I dare say that he's a kind of defender of rationalism. And uh, he's also known for uh, his discussion, discussions with even believers about the value and the relationships between religion and uh, ethical and moral values. If one is interested, in, uh, may, one may look at his uh, uh, conferences and discussions, which are, some of them are at disposal on, on YouTube. <laughs> and so you and, uh, and it is with great pleasure that I give him the word now, and so please you may begin. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I apologize for speaking um, in English, but you would understand, my, you would understand me better if I spoke in English than if I spoke in Italian. And those of you who I know, I know your English is very good, so please accept my apologies for that. Um, so the title of today's talk is Yep. Better. <laughs> so the title of today's talk is Is Religion a Force for Good or Evil? Um, that's a question that has a very great scope uh, and a definitive answer to that question would involve a very wide ranging sort of historical inquiry that would cover the very different kinds of religious institutions that have existed at different times and places in the history of the world. Um, and would look at all of the very many different sorts of influences that religion has had in the political, ethical, and other sorts of spheres. Um, that would be a very big task, um, and possibly nobody is able to carry out that task by themselves. Certainly, I'm not. Uh, but I think it's possible to shed some light on the question by looking at the influence of religion in some particular cases. And today I'm going to look at three particular sorts of case which illustrate, I think, uh, the impact of religion first in the intellectual sphere uh, and then in the ethical or moral sphere and then finally in the political sphere. I should say also that my own personal uh, experience with religion has been with two sorts of religion. First of all, uh, Islam, and second, uh, Protestant evangelism. Um, but I'm aware that probably for most people here, your direct experience of religion will have been with the Roman church, uh, which is the Church of Italy, 
Uh, so I will be saying something about the influence of the Roman Church uh, for the first part of this talk, but towards the end I shall talk a little bit about other religions with which I've had more direct personal experience myself. Let me start then by saying something about the intellectual influence of religion. Uh, and one sort of influence that I think it has is essentially a form of distortion of intellectual inquiry. And what do I mean by this? It's a natural and very primitive human tendency to try to understand things um, and to try to know and some form of philosophy or science which are essentially aimed at understanding the origins of the phenomena that we observe have existed for as long as civilization has existed. Uh, but it is also uh, an intellectual tendency of human beings to explain things in terms with which they're familiar. And there is a particular primitive tendency to explain phenomena that we observe in what you might call personal or human terms. So that, for instance, uh, many thousands of years ago, it would have been natural to try to explain uh, events of the weather or events uh, in the heavens or other sorts of natural events through the postulation of some agency, some supernatural being or entity that produces these effects. Now that tendency is one that you would have hoped or thought after thousands of years of scientific progress uh, has gone or been effaced. We can explain all things like the weather and celestial motions and very many other natural processes without any sort of appeal to any agency or intelligence or supernatural beings. But it is, I think, one of the intellectually distorting effects of religion that uh, it has promoted the survival of that primitive tendency. Um, and in consequence, people are still likely to draw conclusions about the explanations of phenomena that they can't understand in terms of the operation of agencies, uh, of supernatural beings, uh, when the evidence doesn't warrant this at all. So that's what I mean by the first kind of uh, operation of religion, which is a sort of intellectual distortion. Let me start then by talking about, uh, well, let me talk about two examples of this. Um, the first sort of example is a kind of argument for the truth of at least one of the basic myths of the, the monotheistic religions, by which I mean Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, and the sort of reason that I have in mind is one that proceeds from the observation of the apparent order and design in the universe to the belief in some agent or agency that produced this design. Uh, this is the statement, uh, the Catholic statement of that view. Uh, starting from order becoming contingency and the world's order and beauty, we can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and the end of the universe. And what I want to focus on in that statement is the um, reference to order and beauty. The sort of argument that I have in mind, what's known as, as you can see as the teleological argument or the argument from design, uh, is an argument that says that the universe seems somehow to be extraordinarily well suited or well fit for the purposes of the creatures that live in it and especially for the purposes of human beings. This argument has taken various forms uh, and the form that it traditionally took, certainly up until say 1859, the form that this argument most normally took, uh, was one that started out with an observation of facts of biology and facts of, in particular, anatomy and physiology. So an example of the argument uh, is uh, the fact that if you think about the human eye, that seems to be very well suited to its environment. The eye is able to see things at a very great distance and also things that are very close. It's able to see things at a very high level of ambient light, 
and also to adjust to be able to see things in the dark as well, so that we can see at night as well. We can see reasonably well at night and we can see well in the day as well. And this requires a remarkable sophistication uh, in the construction of that organ for us to be able to uh, achieve this purpose. Another example, I suppose, would be the difference between the digestive system of cattle and the digestive system of human beings. So cattle have two stomachs, and that's what allows them to eat grass, uh, whereas human beings have only one, and it's designed to eat the sorts of things that are nutritious for us, or at least it appears to be so designed. This was Russell's uh, version of the argument. He says... You all know the argument from design. Uh, everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world, and if the world was ever so little different, uh, we could not manage to live in it. Uh, that is the argument from design. It sometimes takes a rather curious form. For instance, it is argued that rabbits have white tails in order to be easy to shoot. That argument, uh, as I said, was popular until 1859 or not long after. The reason that I chose that specific date uh, for the demise of the argument is, of course, because that was the date at which Darwin's theory uh, was published um, and rapidly uh, became very well known. It's an extremely well-confirmed theory. This is the theory of evolution, uh, and it's perfectly able to explain the appearance of design, at least in terms of physiological features such as the construction of the eye, or the human digestive system, or the digestive system of cattle, um, or indeed the fact that rabbits have white tails, it's perfectly able to explain all of those things without any appeal to some supernatural uh, entity or agent who arranged things in such a way that they were fit for human purposes or for the purposes of the animals that possessed them. Now, you would have thought, or you would at least have hoped, that the matter would have ended there, and that you, know, people being rational and responsive to the evidence, uh, would at that point have stopped being so concerned about inferring intelligent design from the appearance of intelligent design on the grounds that it has a perfectly good and plausible and valid alternative explanation, evolution, which, as we know, makes no appeal whatever to either intelligence or any other sort of design. But in fact, and this is something that illustrates the tenacity of the primitive illusion that I started by mentioning, uh, in fact, this argument too has adapted to the change in its environment, uh, and the version of the argument that is now popular amongst scientists and theologians is one that's quite independent of considerations about evolution or uh, uh, quite independent of Darwinian considerations. So the version of the argument, the more modern version of the argument that I have in mind is, what's the, is the uh, cosmological version of the argument. Um, and it starts out from a completely different observation from the one that I just mentioned. So it starts out with the observation that if we look at the uh, uh, certain facts, very fundamental facts, about the constitution of the universe, we find that if those facts had been different by even a very small amount, then we would not have been able to live, and in fact there would have been no life at all in the universe. Uh, if we take just one example of this, um, if we consider the fundamental feature of the universe, which is the ratio of mass between the proton and the electron. That ratio takes a specific value, um, which is, I think, a few thousands or something. Um, if that ratio had been different by as small a part, as small an amount as one part in 10 to the power of 37, there would have been no life. There would have been no possibility of the chemical bonds forming that are necessary for proteins to exist. Uh, and so there would have been no possibility of organic life of any of the sorts that we see on our planet. So this seems to be evidence of some very specific, what's called fine-tuned uh, uh, value of certain fundamental constants in the universe uh, which seems somehow to be fixed to a very particular value. It's very unlikely. It's, it would be like uh, 
winning the lottery billions and billions of times. That's how unlikely uh, this would seem to be. Um, and of course, if you did win the lottery billions and billions of times, you wouldn't think that it had arisen by chance. You would think that somehow someone was fixing it so that you had won. And this is indeed the conclusion that many people draw, including, I'm sorry to say, not only theologians and priests, but people who ought to know better, by which I mean uh, uh, scientists. So this, for instance, is a quotation from um, Paul Davis, who's a well-known uh, British astrophysicist, who says, uh, there is, this is from a book from uh, the mid-80s, but nothing, you know, the, the facts that I've described haven't been, haven't changed since then. Uh, he says, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has, sorry, that should say fine-tuned nature's numbers, the impression of design is overwhelming. Well, of course, nothing, nothing in what I've said gives us any reason at all to draw this sort of conclusion any more than the operation, the existence and operation of the eye uh, or of the digestive system gives us any reason to draw a similar conclusion. Uh, and there are two sorts of grounds for this. The first ground is, the first ground for objecting to this sort of argument uh, is, of course, that when I said that if these physical constants had changed by such and such small a part, such and such a small proportion, there would have been no life in the universe. That's, that's plausibly true. However, that gives us no grounds at all to assign any particular probability to the assertion that they took the value that they actually did. There's an essential and important contrast between the example that I gave about winning the lottery and the example about the physical constants of the universe, which even you know, some sophisticated scientists seem to have missed, which is the fact that in the case of a lottery, we have very good reason to think that it's unlikely you would win the lottery by chance because we've observed a very large number of lotteries in the past. That's our basis for saying that it was unlikely. We've seen many lotteries in the past. We've seen that you know, you've never won any of them. Uh, and we've seen that you know, we have reasons uh, on the basis of observing many lotteries for saying that the chance of anyone winning a particular lottery is say one in a million or one in 25 million or whatever the, uh, whatever the figure is that's supported by our evidence. We have no evidence at all for considering it to be particularly unlikely that these ratios, these mass ratios, took the value that they did rather than some other value. The only basis, the only reason for assigning one probability rather than another in this particular case or in any other case can be from observations of repeated tests. But it's in the nature of the case, in the nature of this particular case, that of course there is only one universe and there's only one set of values that these physical constants took, only one ratio that these physical constants took. We do not have the data that you would need from observing many different universes created uh, according to very many different initial conditions, to suppose that that's, any, that's particularly unlikely, or indeed that any mass ratio should be given the same uh, weight of probability as any other mass ratio. And so the assertion that the thing seems to be some, some sort of extraordinary coincidence, which is implicit in this passage for, uh, from Paul Davis, is something that has no support at all. It seems to be something for which there's no evidence and is just made up and is, I think, uh, an example, again, of the persistent tendency in human thought to attempt to postulate explanations in terms of a personal agency or some personal being or, or supernatural force when we can't think of the correct explanation of something. Um, but that, that primitive tendency is no more valid when applied to this sophisticated example by astrophysicists or uh, theologians than it was when applied to the observation of the crude order in the world around us by um, more primitive people who live hundreds or thousands of years ago. I said that there were two reasons 
why this argument was hopeless. Um, and that was the first one. The second one uh, is that even if something like the conclusion is warranted on the basis of the evidence that I've described, nothing in that conclusion uh, gets us anywhere near the, sorts of the sort of thing that should interest people who have an interest in religion. Let it be true, uh, it isn't true, but let it be true that the physical constants in the universe do indeed speak of some sort of design, uh, of uh, some sort of intelligent design. Nothing in that fact, nor indeed in any possible evidence that I could even imagine, gives us any reason for identifying that designer with the dubious character described in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, who, rather than spending his time fixing the values of physical constants, um, instead takes a very unhealthy interest in what you and I wear, what we eat, whether we work on a Sunday, who we sleep with, and so on. And so for that reason, I think that we should separate any conclusion that can be plausibly drawn from uh, this data, although I think it would be implausible, uh, from any of the claims that are of interest to monotheistic religion. The best statement of the point that I've just made was due to David Hume, uh, who in his dialogues wrote the following, uh, in a word, he said, a man who follows your hypothesis, that is the hypothesis of the design of the universe, is able perhaps to assert or conjecture that the universe sometime arose from something like design, uh, but beyond that position, he cannot ascertain one single circumstance and is left afterwards to fix every point of his theology by the utmost license of fancy and hypothesis. In other words, he just makes it up. Uh, this world, for all he knows, is very faulty and imperfect compared to a superior standard and was only the first rude essay of some infant deity who afterwards abandoned it, ashamed of his lame performance. Uh, it is the work of some dependent inferior deity uh, and is the object of derision to his superiors. The point of the passage being, of course, that nothing in the sort of evidence uh, to which uh, Davis is pointing in this passage gives us the slightest reason to think that whatever designer there was, even if there was one, has anything to do uh, with the sort of character who is supposed to be omnipotent and all of the other things uh, that Christians believe. Okay, so much for the first sort of influence that religion has. Uh, that is to say, for the sort of, uh, for its uh, intellectual uh, influence. Um, and this is an example, I think, of the intellectual distortion that uh, religious beliefs or their vestiges impose upon people, including intelligent people, who ought to know better. I'm now going to say something about the ethical impact of religion. And again, because the subject is very general and covers a very large, uh, a very large and diverse area, it would be impossible to say anything particularly plausible um, about, that was, that was plausible and well supported about the ethical impact of religion completely generally. That's something that one, have to, one would have to judge of by the balance, of, uh, the balance in either direction. On the other hand, I think we can learn something from looking at particular cases, that is to say, the particular influence of religion on specific moral and ethical problems that uh, people actually face. And the example that I'm going to discuss now is one in which, as a matter of fact, I think uh, both the Roman Church and the church which is in, in Great Britain, the church which is the established church, that is, to, or rather, sorry, not in Great Britain, but in England, the established church, which is the Anglican church, both of those churches, I think, have in fact made a contribution to one particular ethical debate, uh, which is positive, or at least which I believe to be positive. Um, and that's partly to do with the one-sided nature of the debate, um, though I will say that whilst the contribution uh, 
is positive, uh, it is nonetheless uh, something that has an unfortunate effect on, uh, on the debate in other ways. And what I have in mind is the uh, uh, public debate um, on abortion rights. In the United Kingdom, for those of you who don't know, in the United Kingdom, the law on abortion rights is that the, they're, uh, they're legal until uh, for the first 24 weeks of gestation. Um, in Italy, I think it's about half, it's about half of that. So it's, it's about 12 weeks in Italy. But in England, the law is much more liberal. Um, abortions are legal up to 24 weeks. Um, and whilst nominally speaking, uh, they need to be procured on the grounds of the, the psychological or physical health uh, of the mother, they are in fact available fairly routinely um, up, to that, up to that point in the UK. Uh, and uh, there, in contrast again to Italy, the number of abortions since the, the number of legal abortions since legalization uh, has increased. It's increased in both absolute and proportional terms. So the first full year of abortion uh, of legalization in Great Britain was 1969, um, and in that year there were about 50,000. Um, it's risen to not far short of 200,000 in 2011. Um, and that's not because, for instance, uh, the number of women between 15 and 45 has increased um, in proportional terms, that is, as a proportion of the number of women uh, between those ages, uh, the rate of abortion has approximately tripled as well. Um, in Italy, by contrast, I believe that the numbers are A, smaller in both absolute and proportional terms, and B, have decreased, have fallen, since uh, the peak, which was uh, in the early 1980s. Now, there's no doubt that this is something to do with the nature, this difference between Great Britain and Italy is something to do with the nature of the public debate in Great Britain, um, where at least amongst um, secular thinkers, uh, it tends to be dominated by the view that the entire issue of abortion rights is an issue about state interference into the autonomy of the individual, in this particular case, the individual mother. So, for instance, this passage, um, this is in fact a passage from an influential paper on abortion which was published in the United States um, at around the time of the Supreme Court ruling uh, on abortion in the early 1970s. Um, but it well captures um, the, the general view of, I would say, most otherwise enlightened liberal people in Great Britain. What the passage is stating, I won't, I won't read it out, but I'll just summarize it. Um, what the passage is stating is that the important thing to think about in this case is the mother's ownership of her own body. And the right to an abortion, the right to terminate a pregnancy, is the right, is an extension of the right of control over your own physical body. Accordingly, any state interference in uh, abortion, any attempt by the state to regulate it or restrict it or to prohibit it um, should be no more acceptable in a liberal society that respects individuals' rights over themselves um, than any other attempt of the state to restrict what somebody does to one's own uh, body. Of course, there are such restrictions in other areas, so whilst one is allowed in most Western countries to smoke and drink, there are other drugs that you're not allowed to take, so there are some, even, even if it does no harm to anyone else, so there are some restrictions, but those too would be, could I think reasonably be objected to on these grounds. In any case, the main point that I want to make now is that the secular side of the public debate in Great Britain on abortion is dominated by the sort of view that uh, Judith Thompson uh, states in the passage that um, I'm just describing, a view which she says uh, was one that was exclusive to women, but uh, certainly nowadays in Great Britain, that's not true. <laughs>
it is to the credit of both the Roman and the Anglican churches um, that they oppose that view um, and that they present the issue in the more complicated and nuanced way in which I think it should be presented, or at least they force us to think about it in that way. What I mean is that, of course, the debate about abortion should not be simply a debate about whether or not somebody has the right to dispose of their own body as they see fit. It is rather a debate about when, if ever, well, how, rather, we should adjudicate between competing rights of two individuals. Because it's plausible that at least at some point in the pregnancy, uh, though as we'll see, the, the Roman church takes, the Catholic church takes an extreme view on this, it's plausible that at least at some point in the pregnancy, a woman terminating an abortion should, uh, sorry, a woman considering an abortion should be weighing up her own rights against those of another person, because there is another person whose rights are involved in the decision. And as I said, it's to the credit of the, uh, of the church that it emphasizes, um, it emphasizes this view. This is from um, uh, the uh, Evangelium Vitae from 1995. So this is John Paul II. Among all the crimes which can be committed against life, procured abortion has characteristics making it particularly serious and deplorable. Uh, procured abortion is the deliberate and direct killing by whatever means it is carried out of a human being in the initial phase of his or her existence, uh, extending from conception to birth. Although the Church of England characteristically never officially puts it in quite such forthright terms, it does agree that the procuring of an abortion is a grave sin, uh, and for largely the same reasons. Namely, that in that particular case, there is, it involves the killing of a person, an innocent person, in the interests of somebody else. And whilst it may be true that, for instance, in order to save your life, it's morally permissible to kill another person, uh, it is nevertheless hard to see that, uh, that such practices um, can defensively be sanctioned, and in fact, in, in the case of Britain, financed uh, by the state, um, in all the cases in which, in, which they do actually, uh, in which they do actually take place. So this is one area, I think, where uh, religion has, in fact, uh, had a positive effect um, and has been a sort of counterweight to what I consider to be um, uh, a somewhat one-sided uh, secular view of the question. On the other hand, I don't think uh, it would be correct um, uh, to leave the matter there because I think that the church's pronouncements on this do themselves uh, deserve further scrutiny and criticism. This uh, is a statement from uh, uh, Dignitas Persona, which is, um, uh, so this was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, I suppose. So the, the, the last pope. Although the presence of the spiritual soul uh, cannot be um, observed experimentally, uh, the conclusions of science regarding the human embryo give a valuable indication for discerning by the use of reason a personal presence at the moment of the first appearance of human life. Uh, how could a human individual not be a human person? The human embryo has, therefore, from the very beginning, the dignity proper to a person. If you like, you can think of that passage as a sort of elaboration on the very last sentence of the previous one. So the previous passage from Evangelium Vitae said um, that the human being's existence extends from conception to birth and obviously beyond, but the important point being that it begins at conception. And uh, this passage uh, confirms it um, where it says uh, the human embryo therefore has therefore from the very beginning the dignity proper to a person um, uh, and it's something that appears at the first, the first appearance of human life, which of course is at the moment of conception. Well, there are some people whom I've heard deny that life begins at conception, um, but whatever else you think about this issue, certainly life begins at conception. If you think that a plant is alive or a bacteria is alive or an animal is alive, then you must think that a fertilized egg is alive. <laughs>
Now, why am I saying that I think this makes the debate, um, this, this also simplifies the debate or makes it too one-sided? Well, the reason is that whilst I agree with um, uh, the church's position that at least in some cases, uh, the decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy must involve the balancing of two competing rights, that is rights between the rights of the mother and the rights of the unborn child or fetus or whatever you want to call it. Nevertheless, I don't think that you have to hold this position on the basis that human rights begin and the right to life begins at the point of conception. What makes it plausible to think that, what makes that, that view seem inescapable, is of course the commitment uh, of, uh, of the church, as stated here and elsewhere, uh, to the belief that a human person has a soul. Uh, a soul being a single, if you like, psychological or spiritual entity that is the subject of experience uh, and the bearer of values and the bearer of, of guilt and so on. And this soul is something that starts at the beginning of your life and continues to exist throughout your life and ceases to exist when you die. That view is in opposition to the view of many philosophers and is in opposition to uh, the more sophisticated uh, uh, participants in the philosophical and scientific debates on this question. Because, of course, there is no philosophical uh, compulsion to think that a human being is a single thing that starts to exist when it begins and continues all the way through until death. A different way of thinking about a person would be in the way we actually think about, let's say, a country. So this was, this was uh, the analogy of David Hume. A country, let's say Italy for instance, Italy has existed for about 150 years and will continue to exist for, for many thousands of years, no doubt. Um, or or will, will, will soon cease to exist perhaps. Um, there is no one institution possibly or no one person or no one thing that began to exist when Italy began to exist and will cease to exist when Italy ceases to exist. Certainly no person has been alive throughout that period not the monarch or the president or anyone else. Nor perhaps, or even if this is the case, it needn't be the case, has any one institution continued to exist throughout that time. Rather, Italy is a complex of a variety of different interrelated persons and institutions, some of which will cease to exist, others will start to exist later, and they'll continue to stand in this complicated relationship. So although we can't point to one single thing that persists throughout the lifetime of Italy, we can nevertheless say that Italy itself has existed for 150 years. That is, in the manner of a complex object, not in the manner of a simple object. And the point of the analogy is that for Hume and for many other thinkers, we should think of individual persons as like countries rather than as like single entities that persist throughout their lives. Let me just say something about the grounds for this view before I go on to say something about the consequences of it. Uh, this, is, this is David Hume. Um, he's, he's asking himself about the soul. He says there are many philosophers, including, of course, um, all Catholic thinkers, who believe that there is a soul, that it persists throughout your life, ends when you die, or perhaps continues after you die, but at least leaves your body when you die, and it's that single thing uh, that is the bearer of all of your attributes. And he says, well, there may be people who think that, but let's see if we can actually ever observe such a thing. Um, for my part, when I enter most intimately into, my, into what I call myself, says Hume, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, uh, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception, and this is the crucial bit, and never can observe anything but the perception. What Hume is saying there is that if we look at the actual 
observational evidence that there is for supposing that there's a self or a soul that continues to exist throughout your life, um, we don't find any at all. It's an experiment, I suppose, that you could all try for yourselves. Uh, if you try to think about what you, your psychological experiences are, you might find one or another particular kind of psychological experience, as he has um, heat or cold, light or shade, etc. You might find those experiences. Um, but you're never actually aware of some single thing that's persistent at all times in your life, and that you experience at all times uh, whilst you're alive. Rather, you're aware of very complicated and interrelated psychological states, and perhaps this should include states of the brain as well, but we needn't, we needn't go into that. And the important point is that a person's mental life is not, does not have a single centre, which is the subject of all of the rest of somebody's mental life, but rather it's a very complicated and interrelated network of different psychological states. And it was on this way of thinking about himself, and Hume supposed everyone else, um, that he developed a model of a person's life which made it more like, as I said, the life of a country than like the life of some simple object like, say, an electron. According to Hume, then, we should think of ourselves as commonwealths, so that you now may have no psychological states at all in common with you as you were 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or as you will be in 10 years' time, or in 20 years' time. Instead, there will be a number of interrelated psychological states, um, some of which cause others or are effects of others, some of which are similar to others, and so on, whose overlapping over time constitutes your survival as a person, but no one of which continues to exist throughout your life. That then was the conception of what a person is, what it is to be a human, a human individual, uh, that we find in Hume. And indeed, you know, there are interpretations of, of modern neurophysiological work that give, something like, give us something like this view. Um, so if you look at the, the work of Daniel Dennett especially, for instance, you'll find something like approximately a Humean approach to the self in that more modern 20th century form of inquiry. Now if we do think of ourselves in this way, um, then this has the most, profound in, the most profound consequences for the way we think about our own lives and our own deaths. Um, just briefly, um, it's not directly related to abortion, but just briefly to illustrate um, the depth of the insight, uh, if one thinks about one's own death, one naturally thinks that something is coming to an end which is in existence at the present moment. Uh, but on this view, that's not what happens at all. Uh, on this view, nothing happens when you die, that is, when your psychological life ends, bless you, nothing happens when your psychological life ends that hasn't been happening already throughout your life. Throughout your life, you've been losing memories, or you've been changing psychological traits, traits of your character and so on, have been uh, being exchanged one for another, you've lost memories, you've had new experiences, and so on. So that as it might be, as I said, almost nothing of your psychological life as it was 10 or 15 years ago survives in the brain that is here now. We can, in a sense, therefore, say that that person has died, because although there are traces left of the, those psychological states, none of those psychological states exist. And when you die, the psychological states that are present now or that will be present in your brain in many years to come will start to wink out of existence, but of course they'll leave traces behind in the minds of other persons as well. So we shouldn't think of death, according to this view, as something that constitutes the termination of, what's been what, uh, the termination of something that's been in existence throughout your life. When you die, nothing comes to an end that hasn't already come to an end at some point in your life. And perhaps this, has, this fact had something to do with Hume's own um, relative uh, calmness uh, in the face of his death, as is, as is reported by, um, by Boswell. Moving now to the other end of life, to the beginning of life, uh, we can see that the question of when something starts to become human uh, 
may in fact be a complicated and difficult question to answer and can't simply be settled by the pat pronouncements of either the secular extremists who think that the fetus has no rights at all up until birth, the why birth should be of so, such, such ethical importance is unclear, either them or the Catholic theologians who think that a fetus has human rights and is in fact a human being from the very moment of conception. If you take something like this view, then the more plausible answer would be that when we look at, the, when we adjudicate on the, on, on the moral permissibility or otherwise of the termination of pregnancy, we should think about at what point in its existence a human fetus, a bundle of cells, starts to become a person. So that the organic matter can exist for a while and may at first have no mental life or psychological features at all, but will gradually, as it develops, develop a certain amount of psychological complexity. So the fetus doesn't, uh, the, the zygote does not feel pain, but at a certain point the fetus does feel pain. The zygote um, uh, may not have any other sort of mental states or any primitive cognitive states or anything like that, but at a certain point of development, either before or after birth, it does acquire cognitive mental states. And the sort of complexity that, uh, that is involved in making something a human being is not, therefore, the snapping into existence of a single, simple soul, but it is rather uh, the development of something that we can, we can uh, measure by thinking about the sorts of neuro, the stages at which the brain develops at different points in, the ways in which the brain develops at different points in pregnancy. So when, for instance, in this passage from Dignitas Personae, uh, he says, Ratzinger says, um, the conclusions of science uh, give a valuable indication for discerning by the use of reason a personal presence at the moment of the first appearance of human life. How could a human individual not be a human person? Well, when he says that they give a valuable indication for discerning by the use of reason a personal presence at the moment of the first appearance of human life, that's simply false. Okay? They do not give anything of the sort at the beginning. If by the first appearance of human life we mean the fertilization of the egg, uh, then there is no reason at all to think that at that stage we have any of the sorts of psychological complexity or interrelated states that would constitute uh, the fertilized egg as anything like a person. That thing continues to exist but becomes a person at a certain stage in its existence, just like a community might after a while become a country at a certain stage in its existence, in its existence when it's acquired the right kind of complexity, not at the appearance of some simple object as, uh, 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 such as the soul, um, as is believed in by religious, by Catholic dogma. It is for this reason then uh, that I would return an ambivalent conclusion about the influence of religion upon this particular ethical debate. I should emphasize that it's, it's ambivalent. I am generally opposed um, to all forms of religion. I think they're wrong, wrong and absurd. But I would say that as a matter of fact, and given the present climate, certainly in the United Kingdom, things may well be different in Italy, um, it is fortunate that there are at least some people, though they may happen to be religious, there are at least some people uh, who oppose the dominant secular view. The dominant secular view, which is that it's simply a matter of the rights of the parent, um, is one that I think is far too simplistic and one-sided. On the other hand, the reason that I'm ambivalent about it is that I think the opposing view, as stated in the encyclicals that I mentioned, is also far too simplistic and one-sided. And that if we approach the question uh, with the proper degree of sophistication, as shown by Hume in the passage that I mentioned, uh, you know, we'll at least be able to see what kinds of investigation would help us come to what I think will be reasonable and ethically defensible answers to this question. So as it might be, for instance, it would be defensible perhaps to say that the correct point at which abortion becomes permissible, this ceases to be permissible, is the point at which the fetus starts to feel pain, let us say. That might be reasonable, and if that's 20 weeks or 24 weeks, that would be a reasonable, that would be a reasonable point, but if it's less, then that, uh, that earlier stage will be a reasonable point as well.
Let me now turn to the third sphere in which I want to describe the influence of religion, um, and this is the political sphere. Looking only at the influence of the Roman Church, um, it's almost absurdly easy to find cases, uh, to find instances of its, uh, um, of the unfortunate effect that it's had upon political life. Largely, in many of these cases, I would say it has acted in alliance with the forces of reaction and the forces of authority, um, and generally against um, liberal or progressive views. Um, and it has also, of course, uh, sanctioned um, all kinds, horrific kinds of violence um, in defense of uh, these status quo. Um, I mean, we don't need to go back as far as the Inquisition or the Crusades um, or the Thirty Years' War um, or the English Civil War or any of many other discreditable historical episodes to see this. In more recent times, almost completely at random, thinking of three episodes in the 20th century, if we think about, for instance, the Spanish Civil War, this is a quotation from a book by a Benedictine uh, who says that on the outbreak of the war, uh, the great majority, that is to say nearly the entire hierarchy of the Spanish church, uh, not only did nothing to restrain the conflict, um, but spurred it on by joining almost en bloc one of the two sides, that is uh, the phalangist, uh, the side that ended by being the victor and by demoning, demonizing whoever was working for peace. To take a second example, um, again, almost completely uh, random, uh, this was uh, Italy in the 1920s. Sorry, Italy in the 1930s. Uh, Mussolini's anti-Semitic laws were backed by leading Catholic periodicals uh, and praised by the rector of the Catholic University of Milan um, as part of the terrible sentence that the deicide people has brought upon itself and for which it goes wandering the world, unable to find peace, the peace of a fatherland, while the consequences of that horrendous crime pursue it everywhere and at all times. Now, I should say, of course, that that, that quotation from, from the rector of that university um, is, from his own perspective, completely correct. Because, of course, um, as you all know, there is a passage in St. John uh, which explicitly pins the blame for what Christians regard as the deicide upon the Jewish people, and not only upon the particular Jewish individuals who were present at Calvary, but on all of them and all of their descendants for the rest of time. Of course, this is, um, uh, this is a manifestation of another and different sort of primitive right, um, um, uh, primitive belief, which was the belief in collective guilt. So nowadays in enlightened modern societies, you would hope or you would think that people are responsible for what they have done, not for what their parents have done or for other people whom they may never have met have done, and you should perhaps justly be punished for something that you yourself have done. Um, but it isn't considered the mark of a civilized society, I would say, to punish somebody for what his brother did, or what his father did, or for what somebody of his same race did. In fact, that would be a particularly savage and barbaric view to take. It is, however, the view of the Catholic Church, at least as stated in, in, uh, in St. John, and as stated by this particular person, um, who gives in, in as concise and straightforward a way as you could imagine the reasons why uh, the Catholic Church would have been um, entirely consistent to support, as it has done through history, uh, the persecution of the Jewish people. The third example is more recent. Uh, the third example concern well, it's more recent and also less recent. Um, and it concerns the disaster in Rwanda in 1994, um, which, as you all know, uh, was an episode of a uh, massacre of the Tutsi minority population by the Hutus. The African Union, uh, the Organization of African Unity, um, published a report in 2000 called Rwanda the Preventable Genocide on, the, uh, on, on this episode, um, in which it blamed uh, a very large number of organizations around the world, including the French government, the Belgian government, and the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, one of the things on which it blamed the Catholic Church uh, was the racial views that were taught to uh, Rwandans um, 
at the time when Catholic missionaries uh, were present there um, and working with the Belgian colonial power. This view, which they say, which they thought underlay the massacres in 1994, the Hamitic ideologies, it said, of which it says, much of this ideology was simply invented by the Catholic white fathers, these were the missionaries, Catholic missionaries uh, in Rwanda, um, missionaries who wrote what later became the established version of Rwandan history to conform to their essentially racist views. We have seen, the report continues later on, uh, the unfortunate role played by so many Catholic clerics and the hierarchy in general during the genocide, uh, from being active accomplices of the genocidaires uh, to accusing Tutsi rebels of provoking the bloodshed to blaming the atrocities on both sides. Um, as I said, these are three examples taken almost completely at random um, from the history of the 20th century of discreditable episodes in which the Catholic Church has been involved in politics. But I would like to conclude by talking not about the influence of the Catholic, the political influence of the Catholic Church, um, but about the political influence of another monotheistic um, religion, which represents, in my view, the greatest political threat in the West today. I should say it's not so large a threat, to my knowledge, in Italy as it is in Northwestern Europe. Um, uh, nevertheless, I do think it constitutes not only a global threat, but um, uh, potentially one to all the countries of Europe. This religion, the religion that I have in mind, is one that was, well, it was founded um, about 600 years after Christianity, um, by an illiterate um, Arab merchant um, who, at a certain point in his life, started hearing voices. Um, and what the voices were telling him were later written down, and it turned out that what the voices had told him was rather poor plagiarization um, of the Old and New Testaments, uh, missing out some bits and adding other rather more fanatical and unfortunate bits. Um, this religion is very powerful. Um, it controls some of the most powerful, or certainly some of the richest countries in the world, um, and in a particularly nasty and virulent form, um, uh, controls Saudi Arabia, which is, which is one of the richest countries uh, in the world, um, and represents, as I said, uh, an, ex uh, an extreme threat to our life in the West. The threat that it represents, or rather the form of the threat that I want to focus on today, um, is to the liberties that many people in the West have died to secure for us and to preserve for us, um, in particular, the liberty constituted by freedom of expression, which includes freedom of speech. I'll be saying, so I, I will be talking a little bit about Britain now, so um, I think I should probably say something about, uh, some relevant fact about British, relevant facts about British history. Um, One of the means, then, by which Islam threatens freedom of speech is that it's through a sort of indirect means. That is to say, through the connivance of often well-meaning liberal people in the host population. Many Muslims are immigrants, though many Muslims are not, are not immigrants, but certainly the majority of people in Great Britain and other Northwest European countries are either irreligious or, or Christian, at least nominally. Um, but many people, many of them well-meaning, um, assist in the threat to freedom of speech that Islam constitutes um, through well-meaning beliefs, actions, and in the case I'm going to consider legislation. And the reason for this, at least in Britain, is probably mixed up with the unfortunate history of racism in Great Britain in the recent past. So you may know that uh, there, have been mass, there has been mass immigration uh, into Great Britain from the Caribbean and then from South, uh, South Asia um, since not that long after the Second World War. Um, and this provoked vicious and virulent forms of racism amongst uh, not only politicians and people who ought to know better, but also amongst many ordinary working people um, in the 1960s, the 1970s, um, and the 1980s, which in Britain were, uh, were marred 
um, by a number of race riots. It was partly in reaction to this, and an entirely justifiable reaction and revulsion towards this sort of attitude, um, that many liberal people in Great Britain now um, uh, are, of course, not only strongly opposed uh, to racism, but willing to enact legislation in order to restrict it. As well as legislation, it's socially, um, it's socially prohibited. Nobody in, any, in most, British, most of British society, um, you would be shunned if you openly expressed any form of racist views. Unfortunately, this seems to have been mixed up, or at least I can only conjecture that this is part of the reason that there has been some mixing up um, between the perfectly proper revulsion towards racism um, and a similar suspicion of, amongst liberal people, of dislike of, discrimination against, insult or abuse towards the Islamic religion. So that people who say, I think truly, that uh, Islam is dangerous, it's a threat to the world, um, it's a threat to the British way of life, if somebody said that Islam is a threat to the British way of life, that could be confused, that seems to be confused in the minds of many people with racism, which it is not. Your religious belief and your race are two completely different things. I mean, for one thing, you're responsible for your religious beliefs, but you're not responsible for your race. And indeed, the term Islamophobia, um, which is being used in Britain now uh, as, as a description of, this attitude, of an attitude of suspicion or hatred towards uh, Islam, um, is amongst many decent and well-meaning people considered to be on a similar moral, part, or a similar moral level to um, racism. Now, it may be partly as a result of this sort of mixing up of two things which I think ought to be kept separate, namely discrimination against or dislike of someone on the grounds of their race and discrimination against or abuse of someone on grounds of their religion. Those two things should be kept separate. But it may be partly because of a mixing up of that that we now have legislation that's explicitly designed to protect, relig uh, to protect religious beliefs from different forms uh, for, of verbal abuse. This is the uh, Racial and Religious Hatred Act uh, of 2006, which makes it, in fact, a criminal offence, so something for which you could, in principle, go to jail, um, is to use threatening words or behaviour or display any written material which is threatening. Um, if you do that, you're guilty of an offence if you intend thereby to stir up religious hatred. Now, of course, in the United Kingdom, the interpretation of these acts is, is you know, in part down to judges, and there's, you know, there's obviously a danger that an act like that is going to restrict or censor a variety of forms of speech, which I think are entirely legitimate and aimed at criticizing Islam, or Christianity for that matter, in the most extreme and virulent terms, which indeed is what I think they deserve. It's probably also true that um, uh, the Quran and the Bible ought to be banned on the basis of this, um, on the basis of this legislation, though nobody's actually brought a case against them. Um, but that's, that's, if you like, a sort of ironic um, uh, side effect of the legislation, which was intended to stir up, uh, sorry, was intended to, um, uh, to suppress religious hatred, um, but is an inevitable consequence of the sort of factionalism that arises between the monotheistic religions and, indeed, between sects within each religion. So I've been talking about one of the, effect, one of the political effects that religion has, um, and I've, I've said something about um, what I call its indirect effect upon freedom of speech, that is to say, through often well-meaning uh, uh, acts in both the social and the legislative sphere by um, people who are not themselves Muslim. The other sort of effect, um, which is, well, the other sort of effect is more direct um, on freedom of speech, and this is through the explicit threat of violence. I could give you a number of examples um, in um, uh, the recent history of Great Britain, uh, or Holland particularly, or Denmark, or other countries in the Western world, where 
people have been not only threatened with violence, but people have actually been killed um, by adherents of this religion because of what they say. And this is in Western countries, which are supposed to be the freest countries in the world. The most famous example, I suppose, is the, is the case of Salman Rushdie. So this is, this is a case which you all know goes back to 1989. Um, and this wasn't even a case where somebody explicitly made um, direct statements aimed at criticizing Islam, but somebody wrote a fictional account um, which contained allegedly the sort of depiction of, the, of Muhammad that was supposed to be, that was considered insulting. As you know, the Iranian spiritual leader at the time issued a fatwa against him um, and has been under threat of death since then. Um, violence has also been threatened against and carried out on people who have translated his work um, and published it in the UK and elsewhere. Another example which relates directly, which was in fact what prompted the demonstration uh, in London in 2006, I think, that's, uh, um, that's depicted on the slide, was the case of, uh, of the cartoons in Denmark. So what happened was that a Danish newspaper published various cartoons. They were, you know, they, they were, you know, many of them were tasteless and unpleasant, but that's completely irrelevant when it's a question of freedom of expression. Uh, it published a variety of, of cartoons which depicted Muhammad, and this is against um, Islamic beliefs. Um, there were demonstrations um, around the world in which some 200 people died, um, and there have been death threats against uh, a number of Danish and other citizens uh, in consequence of this. Now, as well as actually killing, threatening to kill, and in fact killing people who say things that they don't like, the adherents of this religion, by their example, have of course managed to discourage many other people from saying anything at all that would be considered critical of that religion. And this is a, a, a sort of um, proleptic, if you like, uh, restriction on freedom of speech. One example of this, uh, which is related to the cartoons episode that I've just described, um, concerns a book that was published by Yale University Press about five or six years ago, uh, which was a book about the cartoon episode. It was called, the book was called The Cartoons That Shook the World, um, and it, it was supposed to be about uh, the publication of the cartoons the, uh, and the effects thereof. That book uh, didn't contain the pictures themselves, which caused all the trouble. And in a statement about this, the director of the, the statement is still available on the university press website. Um, the director of the press said, says the following, he said, would including the illustrations enhance the book? Um, yes, the easy answer is of course yes. Uh, but they didn't include them for this reason, he says, the overwhelming judgment of the experts was that there existed an appreciable chance of violence occurring if either the cartoons or other depictions of the Prophet Muhammad were printed in a book about the cartoons published by Yale University Press. It's difficult to see a clearer possible statement of the effect of the threat of violence, the actual carrying out of uh, violence and the implicit threat of further violence has upon the thing that is most precious to us in the West, more important than our material wealth, um, more important than our scientific advances, uh, is the freedom of speech that makes all of those things possible and many other things possible as well. And we are in danger of losing it in the face of a religion which I think constitutes the most serious political threat to the West today. Okay, that was uh, everything that I wanted to say, um, but I think there's a chance for questions now, so thanks very much.
So, yeah, uh, we have, we're having some time for questions now, and uh, I should stress and emphasize that questions can be asked in Italian as well, and we can translate them for uh, Arif, if you like, uh, on the general overview of specific points, or maybe even points that haven't been addressed directly, but are in the general region of uh, this uh, fantastic overview of the problem that Arif uh, pointed out to us. So, are there any comments or questions? So, you seem to have put everyone on the same page here, and there's no uh, disagreement at all on what you say, which is well, remarkable, I'd say. I thought it was funny you gave a talk about uh, science and religion and didn't mention uh, Galileo, even though you're in Pisa. So I thought that was... <laughs> I have uh, one... Um, you, you, you were saying earlier that, uh, um, that a lot of well-meaning liberals are, uh, are maybe getting confused uh, when they see Islamophobia as uh, akin to racism. But the fact is that a lot of these uh, right-wing groups, like the EDL and the BNP, are actually using Islam in the same, discriminating against Muslims, in the same way that they were discriminating against uh, blacks. It's the same people, it's the same ideology, except now they've moved on to uh, Muslims. And uh, basically, yes, although there are like uh, minorities of Muslims that are kind of st out there and talking about beheading uh, people who kind of, uh, offend Islam. Most Muslims aren't like that, but the fact with Islamophobia is that uh, groups like the PNP, the EDL, these other right-wing groups are tarring all Muslims with the same brush. And in that sense, I think it is akin to racism, at least, in that it, it's making these kinds of generalizations over a whole group of people, it's demonizing a whole group of people uh, on the basis of the actions of, say, a minority. And that's why I think that it's maybe a bit more complicated than saying, uh, you know, liberals are kind of really minded and they, they're kind of uh, feeling guilty about the racism that occurred um, during the 70s and the 80s. I mean, because it is, like, these, are, these groups are the inheritors of, like, the National Front's ideology and so on. And if you read their literature, it is basically focusing on Muslims coming over here. They're <coughs> kind of, uh, you know, the bus driver has to kind of stop the bus so he can go and pray. Things like this. Even in the tabloids, there's a lot of these stories that are actually, you can say, they're demonizing Muslims. They're kind of spreading uh, kind of hatred against this group. And even though there are, as you say, there are people, Muslims, who are behaving in a very, very kind of, uh, in a way that is kind of, uh, you know, against the whole kind of principles of free speech, I wouldn't say that, you know, it's enough to kind of say that all Muslims are then threatened. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I agree with the first thing that you said. I mean, it's perfectly true that many of the people who hold racist views also hold Islamophobic views. Um, but the fact that two views are held by, that, that, that there are people who share, who hold both views, doesn't mean we shouldn't discriminate between the views, though it does indeed mean that this might be partly, this might be something to do with, uh, with the explanation for their, for their confusion. Um, and I certainly don't think that it's ever, it's grounds for wanting legislation that deals specifically with religious, uh, religious abuse, insult, or hatred of religion, um, when in fact we have, perhaps not adequate, but we have at least some legislation that also is directed specifically at, and correctly in my view, at uh, racist views. But you're quite correct that the EDL and these other groups, which are, which are sort of the, the inheritors of the National Front, are, um, uh, use Islam as a sort of stalking horse, if you like, for basically people of a different colour who they don't like. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the reasons why these things have been, have been confused. I mean, it's one of the things, I, the reasons I feel obliged to talk about it, about this particular topic, is because A, I'm, I have a Muslim background, so I have personal experience about religion, um, and B, I'm myself from an immigrant minority family, and visibly so. So people are less likely to think that I'm a racist if I say things like that than if, say, Lee Griffin were to say, were to say something like that. Um, I think it's, it's something for which we should blame these groups that it makes it difficult to make this point without coming across as a racist, and I agree with you on that. Yeah. Oh, on the other point, uh, which was to do with the difference between a, a violent and, and vicious minority 
majority who are not like that. It's probably true that there's no other religion in which even a minority in the Western world behaves in anything like that way. So we have, a, the closest you could come to it amongst Christians, I suppose, is in the United States, where there are sometimes um, uh, uh, death threats, and I think once or twice have been carried out against doctors who perform, doctors who perform abortions. Um, and of course, that's, that, that, that's, that's wrong, and it's a threat of violence, but I would say that that's, that is more or less a fringe view, whereas the, the view that I, views that I'm describing, for instance, the killing of people who leave Islam, or the permission to treat like cattle people who don't belong to that religion, are central, in my view, um, to the religion, and generate, an, as a matter of fact, a direct threat to our freedom of speech. Um, so there is a difference of degree between the Islamic case in Great Britain and Holland and elsewhere and the Christian case, Christian evangelist case in the United States, but it is, you know, you're right that it's a difference of degree. I don't think that should stop people from speaking out against it. Are there more questions or comments? Yep. Very much. Um, I was um, fascinated, um, particularly by the abortion issue, and I wondered. Um, I didn't quite understand if you were in favour of abortion, and if so, when you think it should be um, banned. Um, and the reason why I ask is because the um, argument that you exposed um, is, in a way, trying to gloss over the church's attempt to. Um, uh, get hold of women's body, right? So that is, in a way, an attempt to rationalize this historical attempt to get hold of women, of women's rights to do whatever they want to do with their body. So my question is, how do you deal with that? Uh, with that part of the question which you sort of didn't touch? Okay, thanks. So there's, there's two, two separate points in that question. So the first one was, you're right, it was one that I didn't, I didn't actually discuss in any great detail, which is what I actually think about um, abortion. And I suppose my own view, I mean, I said what question, what's relevant to answering the question, but I didn't say what my actual view is. Um, so what's relevant to asking, answering the question is answering the question when the fetus becomes a person. Um, and that, I believe, is at some point before birth, um, but not at the moment of conception. I would say, uh, if you had to pin me to a date, I would say 20 weeks. Um, that is to say, to err on the side of conservatism before the evidence that shows that the thing feels pain. So as I understand it, the evidence is that they feel pain from, from around the early 20s, 20, early 20, so 22 or 23 weeks. Um, and I think abortion is wrong at that point, um, because I think it's a person at that point. Um, and so I think that in order to be conservative, that is not to take the risk of killing innocent people or allowing innocent people to be killed, um, I think the cut-off point should be 20 weeks, but that's sensitive to the scientific evidence. Um, on the other question about the aims, the, the patriarchal, if you want to call them that, aims of the Catholic, Catholic Church, and the connection between that and the doctrine of, of the soul and so on, um, yes, you're quite right. Uh, um, uh, there may well be evidence that, you know, I'm quite willing to believe that this was part, you know, this was part of its agenda, was, as you say, to control women's, uh, women's bodies, um, uh, and that it was promulgating this view you know, on those grounds. Um, uh, that may well be true. Um, and if so, it would be evidence of another way, in which, of the motivation rather, for which the church, by which the church has distorted the debate in the way that I, the way that I described. The, the one thing I would say, it doesn't change the fact that it did, does nevertheless, in my view, have a positive, one positive effect, that it may have had other negative effects historically. The positive effect being that as a matter of fact, I think that the secular debate in the United Kingdom tends to be somewhat one-sided, um, and I think it's important to, to hear this opposing view. But you're quite right that in this particular case, it may be motivated by more sinister, more sinister aims. I don't actually. I think it's perfectly reasonable to be completely secular and opposed to abortion on, uh, on secular grounds, secular ethical grounds, which have nothing to do with religion. Um, but there is, in fact, in Great Britain, I would say that there's a strong association between religion and opposition to abortion. More questions or comments? <laughs>
if I'm allowed, I have one. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's an exercise I do uh, with myself of trying to be, well, let's say try to play God's advocate, right? Um, and it's the following. You argued, especially in the last part of, of your presentation, uh, quite convincingly about the fact that one reason uh, to opt out, if you like, is that there are great dangers of being in, right, and being acritically so. Because if you're in, you're kind of bound to be acritical in some sense, right? Uh, you made the case very clearly for uh, Islam, and uh, it is very probably the greatest threat uh, of of them all. I think we all agree, and we all agree with Richard Dawkins. He recently just made exactly that point in a very, very substantial way. Uh, but one might say, well, you know, that's because you're looking at the wrong God. I mean, we might say, well, the Catholic, Roman Catholic isn't really uh, the right one. You know, maybe that's not one the right one. I mean, can there be a right God that, you know, if we pinpointed that one, we would all be, you know, better off in that sense and, you know, not having to follow you on your argument. Yeah. Um, well, it would be hard, hard to say. I suppose the closest you could come to somebody whose religious beliefs actually motivated what was, at least at the time, a relatively liberal uh, and, and uh, 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 reasonable view, compared at least to his contemporaries, um, was the sort of deism of someone like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson or the other founding fathers of the United States. I mean, of course, by our standards, many of these people were illiberal, they had slaves and so on. Nevertheless, they were remarkably progressive by the standards of their own day. Um, and they did have a kind of abstract belief in a, in, a, in a sort of abstract deity that began, you know, that created the universe, and that was about it. Um, but whether anybody, you know, whether such, a, whether such a belief is likely to be spiritually nourishing for most ordinary people is another question. So, if people turn to religion because they think it answers the big questions in their life and it gives either a sort of meaning or value to their lives, if that's the reason people either adhere to religion or turn to it in the first place, um, then I'd be sceptical whether that sort of rather anodyne God um, you know, would, be, would be attractive. Um, so I don't know whether it would meet the needs that, that make us want religion in the first place. It's just that I think that there are so many other ways to answer these big questions anyway. We have a... We have a you know, a tradition going back of 2,500 years of philosophy of addressing the most important ethical um, questions and also questions about the meaning of your own life. Um, we have a rich, very rich literature um, going back to ancient Greece and including Kant and Hume and many of the other great thinkers that have existed since then. Um, if you turn to religion, then you're shutting yourself off to all of that. Um, and you have very simple answers provided by the beliefs of, of nomads who lived in the Stone Ages, rather than the beliefs of the most intelligent people who have ever thought and wrote. Um, so for that reason, whilst it may be in principle possible, I'd be sceptical of it's actually, you know, in real life, being, uh, being a life possible. There's not a problem of uncertainty, it's just, you know, it's just a break. Okay. Good. Are there more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Arif again. And, and thanks all of, all of you for coming.